G'day, it's great to have you with us for this week's episode of In Focus Recouched. We are going to take you on a journey today to some unexpected places, ancient Persia, wow. yeah, a performance poetry gig, and deep into the mysteries of the humble eggplant. Oh, yum. Well, there's something there for everyone. Well, of course, there'd have to be out of that <laughs> lot, Dora. Well, let's get into it then. Here's James Teagood with Sue Rad. It looks amazing. So who would have ever thought that the eggplant, this luscious, delicious eggplant, was just so healthy for you? It's incredible. Absolutely. Tell us about it. <laughs> well, eggplant, some people are not familiar with it, um, is like a spongy type of mm. vegetable. It's white inside, but it can come with different colours on the outside. So the most yes. common one we typically see these days in Western countries at least is the purple yeah, it was skin this one. one. Yeah, the purple one. Then you but get then the stripey the ones, stripes. you get the white yeah. little eggplants. You get orange, you get green yeah. eggplants in yeah. fact with, with the different colours in the skin. It's incredible. Um, they have a slightly bitter flavour but yeah. Mostly these days, um, they're not that bitter. Oh, so not. one of the traditional ways of preparing eggplant was always to salt them, soak them, wash mm. them, dab them, then use them. You actually don't even have to do it. You can do that, but you don't have to because the modern ones are not very bitter. So to me, what's really exciting about eggplant, it's not the fact that they're very low in calories, a cup. Yeah, only 23 you, calories in a cup. Yeah, yeah, not very much at all. They have vitamin E, yeah. you know, good source of vitamin B6 and so on. It's actually the viscous dietary fibre inside them Oh, tell us about that it. That makes me excited. Okay, yeah. This type of dietary fibre, which is found in foods like oats, is well known to lower your blood cholesterol and to lower your blood sugar level. Now tell me if I've got this right, I think it forms a, a like a gel in your it stomach? It does, yeah. it forms like a viscous gel, that's why okay. they call it viscous dietary fibre. Okay. So when you cook eggplant, if you've noticed, if you've ever eaten eggplant, it becomes sort of gelatinous mm. and creamy and luscious okay. and sweet. So when you have this uh, fibre-like gel in mm. your stomach, it's soaking up stuff. What, what's it, it doing? It does, it does a lot of different things. For example, it actually binds or soaks up what's called bile acids oh. and pulls them out, out they go, down the toilet. Okay. Um, and bile acids is what your liver uses to make cholesterol that floats oh. in your blood. So it's actually siphoning off the starting material that your body uses to make cholesterol. Oh. Also, the so it's starving <laughs> the cholesterol producing factory. You could say that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The other thing that's very interesting is that these soluble fibres are then fermented by certain good bacteria in the gut to form what's called short chain fatty acids. Okay. And these are now being intensively studied because they do all kinds of amazing things in the body. They're really, really important to tone down inflammation in the bowel. Okay. They seem to mm. have an impact on toning down your appetite. Oh. They, again, lower cholesterol and blood sugar, um, but they're also linked to boosting immunity. So it's not even what you put in, it's what the good bugs in your mm. gut, if you're eating a healthy diet, make from yeah. what you put in yeah. that makes eggplant yeah. such an exciting vegetable. Yeah. Look, I'm happy to think that it's uh, healthy for me in that uh, <laughs> wonderful way, but what I love about eggplant, it just tastes so nice. Tell us how you use it. Well, it's so versatile yeah. and it just absorbs flavour and that's what I love yeah. about it. But, you know, many, many years ago, I used to hate eggplant because I only tried it in one particular mm. way. That was until I visited Turkey. Oh. Now, in certain countries um, where they use a lot of eggplant, of course, they know how to prepare yeah, it beautifully. Yeah. So in Asia, for example, yeah. they even steam eggplant. Yeah. Japanese, Chinese can mm. steam eggplant and then drizzle mm. it with something. It's just beautiful. Mm. It's so delicate. Mm. Um, you can bake it. Mm. You can roast it. It becomes incredibly creamy and, and sweet. Um, I make beautiful um, tomato-based pasta sauces. Uh, you can char grill it or oven bake yeah. it and make barba ganoush. Now, oh. have you ever tried barba ganoush? May I try some? Absolutely. This is Mediterranean. This is a dip. Now, um, you've got to go to suerad.com, folks, because she makes barba ganoush, and the recipe's actually on the website. There's a video yeah. recipe for barba yeah, yeah. ganoush, yeah. Here we go. It is a beautiful sort of smoky, creamy mm. dip and spread that you can mm. use instead of butter. Mm. Perfect spread. And you can also buy it in many supermarkets mm -hmm. now or, or green grocers. So mm. ideal replacement for butter. Tell us about this, Sue. Now that I brought in especially for you, James, mm -hmm. something mm. I um, made, and this mm -hmm. is a traditional Greek dish. Mm. Um, I call it succulent eggplant because it's just so succulent when you it eat it. It just looks and succulent. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and this is um, mm. slow cooked mm. um, onions, braised mm. onions and garlic and eggplant and fresh tomato. May I try some? Absolutely, mm -hmm. dig in. Mm. And then 
they're placed in the oven and they're slow baked. Oh. So the flavour is amazing. It's just luscious and mm -hmm. creamy and sweet and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of to die for. And you have that with some salad mm -hmm. and you're done. Oh. And that's one of the beauties of eggplant. Uh, mm. You know, it's not like meat in the sense that mm. it's high in protein. It's not. But it's so versatile that you can use it to mm. cut down on meat, mm. throw a slab on the barbie, yeah, yeah. make it into a pasta sauce, add, add it to a tagine mm. or a curry or a stew, make it yeah. into a dip. You it's know, just so many ways. So many ways with yeah. eggplant and it's always delicious well, and so, so much, good Sue. for you. Now, the great thing about Sue Rand is that uh, on her website, you'll see how to make all these fantastic recipes, but uh, we could talk all day about eggplant, but I'll tell you <laughs> what, I just want to eat this one. It just looks gorgeous. <laughs> Have a go at that. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back to History in Focus, where we're knocking the dust off the past. I'm here with Gary Webster, the editor at Archaeological Diggings. Gary, you've brought us another rock today. Plenty of rocks, eh? Plenty of rocks, mate. Plenty of rocks. What's so special about this one? Well, what's so special about this is actually the writing on it. And let me tell you about this. This is a cuneiform tablet, actually. Cuneiform, OK. You know, we, you go to Egypt was a massive civilization. But there was also the cradle of civilization, Mesopotamia, and lots of people used the cuneiform script. Now, when you go to places like, um, you know, Assyria or Babylon, yeah. Iraq, and so on, you you find these tablets. Now, it was actually we we're actually able to find how to read this stuff from Iran. Okay. And Iran is one of the most spectacular places to visit. It's got some very old ruins from the Persian period, and so on. But uh, beautiful people, it looks by the beautiful, way. The, in, picture. the people are beautiful as absolutely. well. Absolutely. I, I love the Iranians. They're very friend, super friendly people. We see it's not something that you get on the news over here, is it? It, all, it, it, all it is not. Often. And it's a shame because they are just lovely people and they've got some tremendous things to see there. But here in Iran, uh, back uh, quite a few years ago now, was discovered the, the writing on the Behistun Cliffs. Now, they'd seen this, of course, for centuries. People came by this way and wrote these inscriptions. But yeah. what did it all mean? So you can come here today to, to Behistun, just in, in part of Iran, and uh, you can see this massive inscription that was put there by Darius the I. OK, yeah. And, and we that, know that He's mentioned from, in the Bible, yeah, the of Bible. course. Yeah. Yeah. And what's interesting is they've got inscriptions here and they're written in three different languages. OK. And so a bit like the Rosetta Stone to the Egyptians, yeah. how to understand the hieroglyphic writing, this one in three different languages now may be a clue to understand all this cuneiform and stuff. And was it Greek, written. the common one again? Or what no, was the it common? was in, written in Arcadian, it was written in Elamite and in Old Persian. Okay. Now, the Old Persian was really the key to this because they, they didn't really understand it, but it was easy to understand because it was alphabet and so on. Yeah. So they were able to work from that and understand that and work back and understand the cuneiform script from this tremendous... And uh, what kind of things did they find when they translated the... Well, the let me... Well, for, for example, they have thousands of these tablets oh. uh, and 20,000 tablet, clay tablets from one library of Ashurbanipal, a great Assyrian king. But some of so the things... So this was their... This is what they'd do, their, their yeah. little diary entries. This they'd is, go home and they'd chisel out... This is your stone. letter. I send you a letter. Send you one of these things. Wow. But what they, what, what, many things they found, as far as the Bible's concerned, a lot of information. Take for example. Oh, by the way, it was Henry Rawlinson who, is, who worked on a lot of this. Yeah. But you take this script, this one in the middle here, this cuneiform. This is what we call the Gilgamesh epic. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And I've, I've, that sounds familiar. It's yeah. something to do with Noah. Yes. Okay. To do with yeah. the flood. We didn't yeah. call him now. It was um, Utnapishtim. But that clay tablet reads almost like the story of the flood that you find in the Bible. And it's not the only one they've discovered as well. So it's, it helped people realise, hey, this is not some so fairy tale. Said, so this is, Gilgamesh was writing about the flood of this, Noah. The same flood, no question. This okay. is the same flood. Yeah, yeah. It's exciting stuff, so isn't it? It just helps us realise that, again, it's not a bunch of myths and legends. It's yeah. got historical accuracy. Yeah, and especially all the way back to the flood as well. Yeah, well, this one, well, it doesn't date back that far, but it's a story that's common to many yeah. people. It's clearly something happened. Yeah, yeah. Interesting stuff, Gary. Thanks for that. 
It was really interesting what Gary Webster said about Iran, hey? Like, yeah. you know, it's such a friendly place and having all that history there that links back to what the Bible says. It's... Yeah, that, that was a bit of a surprise, wasn't it? Yeah. Iran hasn't really been on my list of places to visit, I have to admit, but who knows, after that, I'm a bit more tempted, actually. <laughs> well, I need a little bit more convincing, but I still love hearing about it and seeing the pictures. Yeah, fair enough. Time for an ad break now, back in a minute. We live our lives running around, rarely stopping to ask ourselves where we're going and what our final destination is. In the end, our lives become little more than routine. Step beyond and discover a path that offers comfort, love and hope. Visit hopeoffer.com forward slash step beyond or call 1300 300 389 for your free copy today. We're going to start with some soybeans. Use some chickpeas, a onion, we have a teaspoon of salt, slice some tomatoes, slice some cucumber, some red onion just to give it a bit of freshness. So just make little falafels like this. They just smell amazing. Let's make our tahini dressing. Let's get in some tomatoes, cucumbers, some falafels. Drizzle some of this lovely dressing. All you need to do is roll it up and you've got a delicious lunch for your family. Hi, welcome back. We're going to see an interview now with a man we had twice on the In Focus set, performance poet Joel McCarrow. Oh yeah, he's a great guy. I really enjoyed chatting with him. Well, I'm here in the studio with Joel McCarrow. Good to be here. And his mysterious few are so mysterious that they're not even here. They've what? disappeared on me. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where they went. So you, you were here a couple of years ago, um, Joel, when you were a solo artist as, yes, a, that's right. as a performance poet. Yep, yep. But now you do have a band. The, yep. the mysterious few. Yes. T tell us about that transition and what's what's going on there. Yeah. Well, it's been a great transition. We, um, I mean, poetry's been my thing for many years, mm -hmm. uh, and I still love doing poetry just by itself, straight a cappella. Um, but I've kind of we kind of started. Uh, doing some some work together, bringing music with my poetry a few mm -hmm. years ago, and it just there was something about it that um, changed the way that I was doing poetry. I think in mm -hmm. a really good way. Wait, like more rhythmic? Yeah, more rhythmic. Changed how I was doing my rhythms, how I was expressing myself, kind of giving me uh, something to kind of sit back into the mm -hmm. music. Um, so someone can do a bit of a solo while you can just let that thought sink in for a while. Yeah, and then you come back, hit him. Yeah, and something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. And we, I just, we just loved doing it together. Yeah. Uh, so me and a guy named, I'll, I'll, I'll reveal who the mysterious few are. Oh, okay. uh, a guy named Josh Furmeister and Rochelle Bohr and, then, and, and two others as well. I'll keep them mysterious. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we just kind of started playing together and really gelled and the, the music added something to the poetry. Okay. Um, we were finding people were quite moved by it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, look, before we go any further, rather yeah. than talking about it, let's just take a quick look at um, one of your clips. Sure. Check this out. To the burdened shoulders, to the clipped wings, and to those who have never tried again to be artists, and to those who have forgotten that they are so, we say, welcome home. Well, that does certainly fit into the category of, of really creative and you're, you're yeah. really upholding artists through that, like yes. trying to encourage them to, you know, find their their gift and, and express it. That, that's awesome. Absolutely, yeah. yeah what, what other sort of themes are, are you exploring through your poetry and music? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of ones within within this new album that we've been creating over the last few months. Uh, kind of a lot focused around story, mm -hmm. around the power of story to um, both change us as individuals and also as a society, kind of the mm -hmm. the big framing stories of our society that we so easily uh, just accept without kind of um, looking at or critiquing or challenging. So kind of the power of um, the power of story and the power of poetry to actually speak into those things mm -hmm. um, and to to challenge some of the things that we just accept as norms I suppose yeah okay. well, such as like, give me some examples oh, I mean within our society I think a huge one would simply be um, kind of the Western dream mentality um, mm -hmm. that we can live uh, comfortably rich sort of comfortable wealthy lives and and not think that it's affecting other people around the world materialism yeah. consumerism, yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah those kind of isms uh, yeah. ideas and I guess the way we like to export our poverty to another 
yeah. to another country. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That we don't think, we don't even consider when we buy it and purchase something at the store who's who's gone into making this thing, who's mm -hmm. gone into producing, getting the extracting things from the ground and producing it and like all that lineup mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. we just kind of pick it up and that one's the cheapest. Yeah, we often go for the cheapest rather than kind of critiquing and thinking about this stuff. So a bunch of the th kind of things revolve around that, um, mm -hmm. around story and challenging and critiquing, but also kind of the personal journey and going on the journey of um, looking at some of the, the I, I think the wounds and the painful times in our lives and mm -hmm. in, in some ways um, welcoming them in a, in a strange way, letting them change us and affect us. One of the one of the poems is called "Waiting for the Storm to Break." It's kind of this idea that's in those storm times of our lives. That's when we actually have the most growth. Yeah, um, yeah, when we actually right. come to discover who we are, when we have those self-confrontational moments. Sort of reminds me of you know the Apostle Paul. You know when Jesus said to him. My power is made perfect mm. in your weakness. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's right. There's a real sort of paradox there. Is there a sort of a, a, a theology or, or a biblical basis for, for some of what you do? Do you see connections there? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. My my creativity and my spirituality, I think, are really intertwined. Mm -hmm. um, and I find, like, I'm not, I do a bunch of poetry within the Christian scene, but I do a lot of it. I'm kind of just part of the poetry uh, scene around Australia, which there is actually a poetry scene, if you can believe that. Um, <laughs> and, and I think, um, one of my joys is is working out how that fits together in that context mm -hmm. um, that kind of moving away from any Christianese and and that kind of stuff and mm -hmm. really embracing and thinking through kind of kind of some of my beliefs and how they um, how they can be reflected on and engaged with and mm -hmm. how they can be put to people as this welcoming kind of mm. kind of thing but definitely my my Christianity and my um, and my creativity come together yeah. um, simply even in the fact of God being a creative God and 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 mm. making us in his image to create in that way in the beginning God created God created yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah. So do you find that when you try to deliver these messages, and so obviously some of them are, might be controversial on yeah. political topics and that sort of stuff, yeah. if you chose to just, say, write a newspaper article or just do a lecture or whatever, yeah. um, do you find that there's a different reception when you when you deliver those sort of messages cr in a more creative way? Yeah, I think there is. I think um, poetry and the stuff that I do, performance poetry, it seems to... It kind of goes beyond just the the head kind of cognition thing, mm -hmm. which is which is what the papers and lectures and stuff mm -hmm. really hit at, um, and and really the heart of poetry is about evoking something, evoking a response from people, from the audience that you're communicating to, and so um, with my poetry, when I get to do that, and it's like that evoking often of a dissonance or a oh maybe that's not right in the world or mm -hmm. a something it's for me that's what's actually going to change people and mm -hmm. bring transformation is the uncomfortable feelings, not mm -hmm. just the, the head recognition that something yeah. might be wrong with the world, but oh, this, this actually hurts to think about it in that way. I think that kind of hurt is what can lead to intentional wow. change. And do you get feedback from your audiences that, that that's what's happening? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're just, we've, we've just started a tour at the moment and, and are up here touring for a few days and even last night and, and the night before just had a bunch of people coming up saying the stuff that um, we were sharing was bringing them to tears about the reality wow. of the world and and their place in the world and kind of filling them with a, an angst but also a hope um, mm. also a hope as to what they could do wow yeah awesome now Joel I have to ask on on behalf of the grandmas out there in particular <laughs> uh, what's well, what's with the hair what's, yeah the, did, my grandma did, would ask that every time I saw her did, did yeah. you just forget to do it for a while or what what's... I did well the last haircut that I actually ha ever had was my uh, was the haircut for my wedding so that was like 11 years ago oh, okay um, <laughs> which was a little bit uh, yeah so I've, I've forgotten for a long time therefore to have a haircut um, <laughs> yeah. but I, yeah it's just my look it has been for a little while and, yeah yeah Obviously, there are young people in your audience who are looking up to you, seeing yeah. what you're doing, and yeah. thinking, "Wow, I have a gift." And uh, do they come up to you and, and sort of talk to you about their gifts and dreams and stuff like that? What what sort of tips or advice? Yeah, do you give them? a lot of them do, and I do, and I run a lot of workshops and stuff in schools and um, all over the place, working with young people who are kind of just discovering their creativity. Um, mm -hmm. And one of, the, I mean, one of the things I always say is that we're all creative. Mm. Um, in, really. In, 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely we're all creative. We may not be all artistic poets, but mm -hmm. in terms of taking something that is inside and letting it manifest on the outside, mm -hmm. taking something that inspires us, mm -hmm. that is beautiful, that is... So we're all yeah. expressive, you could say it another yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I often say to, to kids coming up is um, don't focus on trying to, um, trying to be a good, amazing artist. Simply mm -hmm. focus on trying to express and, and kind of vulnerably and, and authentically express who you are. Because it's in that, I think it's in the vulnerability and the, the authentic expression, that's mm -hmm. where the best creativity comes out of. Yeah. Um, not out of any tips and tools and things like that, but it's simply someone being willing to, in kind of our very shallow surface level society, yeah. someone being willing to go there and to, to open themselves up and say, this is, this is me and express that through their creativity. So one of the, the phrases I always say to, to young people is the scribblings in your journals are the words the world needs to hear. Wow. Um, that if they can just believe in that these writings can actually change lives and when they start ex kind of expressing their own story, it's always the case that someone hears their story in their story. Wow. Um, is, and kind of, cool. yeah, that's where life transformation often happens. Hey, well, thanks so much, Joel. It has been real. It's been, it's been Great. really good. Yeah, my pleasure. So yes, Joel did perform one of his poems for us. We're gonna see it in just a second. Awesome. It's a very powerful vision of the world made new, but parents, I have to warn you, it's definitely in PG territory. We'll say goodbye for now and let Joel McCurro finish off the program. Thanks so much for watching this week. All the best. We'll see you next time on In Focus Recouched. God bless. So I met a man and he saw the world differently. I sat cross-legged at his feet and he told me, remember the past, but cast your eyes forward. For tomorrow, our hope shall be a louder voice than our apathy. Our apathy shall finally take a step forward. Our steps forward shall lead us somewhere, mean something, hold meaning like friends, hold each other crying. I am crying for this world to change. Tears of empathy and sometimes apathy. I cry today for tomorrow. Even these tears shall be wiped from our faces. Lift your cheeks, though they are wet. There is one who shall collect them yet. Hold them in his hands and call it the ocean. Beckon you to set sail. Turn your face to the horizon for tomorrow. The nooses drawn tight around the necks of the oppressed will be like halos, like the saints around their heads, a guiding light for the rest of us. Let us see the way forward comes not through power and politic, but through small acts of courage and change, change, change us like loose coins are never going to fix this problem. So let us go deeper than just charity. Change us like sweatshops closing, change us like politicians stop posing, change us like half the women of the world don't have to be abused, change us like somebody has to stand up. For tomorrow we shall not just talk of gender equality, but rather women who in total work two thirds of the world's working hours will one day get paid more than just 10% of the world's income for tomorrow. We imagine a day when corners do not exist. Those years of muddy lips pressed against white skin, the many times she'd lie under the weight of a man's insecurity, forced into sex slavery, fingers that rubbed bruises into her flesh as the sweat of large men stain her breasts that are the tools of her trade, street worker taking tricks on her corner. Imagine a day when those corners do not have to exist. For tomorrow, the weapons, they'll be piled high 
and tanks, they'll be left dry. Drones in the sky, no more. We turn their swords into plowshares. I make a garden from your M16 and I irrigate the earth with your death machine and hold out to you a meal for us all to sit at the same table for tomorrow. Israeli and Palestinian shall sit down and have dinner again. The rich shall eat with the poor and the oppressor with the oppressed and they shall talk of forgiveness, truth and reconciliation. For tomorrow the betrayed will no longer seek revenge and revenge will no longer be found in the dictionary and neither shall poverty nor infant mortality nor hungry nor thirsty nor children searching through waste dumps, oil pumps leaking the ocean, 21 million in slavery no more for tomorrow we live in colour, for tomorrow we dance on the streets, for tomorrow we look the the other in the eye for tomorrow we embrace for tomorrow we are set free for today we crawl on our hands and knees believing the tomorrow we are seeing stretch our eyes forward move our limbs turn our heads toward the sound of liberation we wait and this waiting is an ache and this ache is a burden, heavy and hopeful. This ache is a back scratch, never quite reaching that sweet spot. So we keep on scratching and we keep on moving and we keep on crawling. We keep going forward. We seek for tomorrow by acting today until this world is as she was always meant to be. It's a typical Vegas night. The city's alive. This is a city that never sleeps. You know, they've got the pyramids over here. You've got the Eiffel Tower over there. And right around the corner, you're in Venice. They're all fakes, of course, genuinely fake. In fact, they say that most people prefer this over the original. Now, what are you guys doing here? What does it look like we're doing here? Anyway. Why are you filming without me? Who are you? I'm the real you. No, you're not. I'm the real me. Now listen, you prove it. Well, I... To receive a free DVD of the documentary Beyond Counterfeit, visit hopeoffit.com forward slash counterfeit or call 1300 300 389.